Welcome to the CSIS Pertamina Banyan Tree Leadership Forum. Uh, we are delighted today to host uh, Minister Josh Frydenberg, which, who is Australia's Minister for Energy and the Environment. Uh, Mr. Frydenberg was appointed Minister for Energy and the Environment in July 2016. He, was ser he served previously in the ministry as Minister for Re Resources, Energy, and Northern Australia. Mr. Frydenberg has also served as Assistant Treasurer and Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister. Uh, he was first elected to the Australian Parliament in 2010 as the member for Kuyang, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, after a career in banking, law, and government. So um, after uh, Mr. Frydenberg gives his remarks, uh, I will, uh, 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 Sarah Ladislaw, my colleague here at CSIS, who leads the Energy and National Security team here at CSIS, will moderate the discussion. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Frydenberg. Well, thank you very much. Well, it's a great um, honor and privilege to be here at the CSIS uh, with my very good friend, Andrew Shearer, who we work together in Canberra. Wonderful to see you here and to be accompanied by the secretary of my department, Dr. Gordon De Bruyne, and I'm sure many familiar uh, faces in the audience. And you got it right, Kuyong. Uh, it's an Aboriginal word. It means resting place although it's far from restful. Um, and it was held uh, by six people pr prior to um, myself winning the seat in 2010. Uh, the longest serving Australian Prime Minister was a man called Sir Robert Menzies. He held the seat for 32 years. Uh, and he was succeeded by an Australian ambassador, subsequent Australian ambassador to Washington, Andrew Peacock, who held the seat for 28 years. And Andrew was an Australian foreign minister. And I was very fortunate when I uh, was running uh, for my first election in 2010 to get Andrew to open my campaign. And he came uh, to speak to the assembled audience, not too dissimilar in number to the people who are here today. And he, he said, Josh, look, if you're lucky enough to get elected to be the member for Kuyong before you give your first speech in the parliament, please send a copy across to, to me, said Andrew, uh, for vetting, a bit like Sir Robert Menzies had said to him when he handed over the seat in 1966. And I said, well, Andrew, what happened? He said, well, I sent across my speech to Sir Robert Menzies, and not long after, the, the phone rang. I said, hello, and he said, Sir Robert here. And Andrew said, well, did you get my speech? And Sir Robert said, yes, I did. And Andrew said, well, what do you think of the speech? And Sir Robert said, it's too long, <laughs> to which Andrew asked the next obvious question, well, what should I do, Sir Robert? And he said, cut it in half. To which Andrew asked the next question, well, which half? And Sir Robert said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> True story. But Menzies actually uh, was n noted and named by Richard Nixon as being the most impressive post-World War leader in, uh, in the world. And I remember Nixon saying that if you know, who is the greatest post-World War leader? And he said, well, it's not de Gaulle, it's not Chu En Lai, it's this man, Sir Robert Menzies. So I feel very fortunate to, to walk in his steps as the member for Kuyong. So I've got some prepared marks, remarks to, to share with you about the rapidly changing energy world, and then I look forward to some Q&A, uh, because it's obviously a topic of major uh, discussion, both here and in my country. Um, as we gather here, the world is facing a once in a century transition, akin to the telecommunications sector when it went from landline to the cell phone, or as we in Australia call it, the mobile. It's the biggest change in our electricity system since Nikola Tesla prevailed over Thomas Edison in what was known as the War of the Currents, the ACDC War well more than a century ago. This transition presents challenges, but there are also great opportunities to be seized. Today I want to make three key points. First, Australia is a superpower when it comes to energy, both traditional and new sources. But our country nevertheless faces some technical challenges as we integrate more renewables into the system and we move to a lower emissions future. 
Second, the steps that we are taking to address these challenges may provide useful lessons for other countries. We have learned you cannot compromise energy security. So when it comes to energy sources, ours is a technology neutral and all of the above approach, as Secretary Perry too has noted for your country. And third, as the world's centre of gravity moves to the Indo-Pacific, Australia and the United States are in prime position to assist our partners meet the needs of booming economies and populations, which will demand a secure, a reliable and an affordable supply of energy. Australia has been called the lucky country, and nowhere is this more evident in the resources and the energy sector. We have the unique advantage of occupying our entire continental landmass, which is the sixth largest in the world. It is a continent rich in resources, both fossil fuel and renewable, as well as mineral. We are the world's largest exporter of iron ore and coal, accounting for 30% of the global coal trade. Our coal is some of the cleanest, high in energy, low in ash. We also hold one third of the world's known uranium reserves. Two mines in Australia, Olympic Dam and Ranger, alone produce 10% of the world's uranium. And in the coming years, we are for forecast to overtake Qatar to become the world's largest LNG exporter. This marks the latest chapter in Australia's integral role in Asia's growth story. From Japan's and South Korea's industrialization after World War II to China's emergence as the regional economic powerhouse to India's huge population growth. Australia will continue to be an LNG exporter, but not at the expense of sufficient supply for our domestic industries. We must maintain sufficient supply of gas to ensure a secure system and an affordable energy system at home. Of course, US investment is integral to Australia's story. The US is still by far the largest investor in Australia, with almost 30% of total foreign investment, 10 times more than the stock of investment from China. With the investment phase of the mining boom coming to a close, we are now moving to the production phase. And while Australia is the world's eighth largest energy producer, it is only the world's 20th largest energy consumer. This means we are a significant energy exporter, sending more than three quarters of our production overseas. We also enjoy the world's best solar resources with the highest solar radiation per square metre of any continent in the world. No wonder many Americans know us as the sunburned country. And we have some of the best wind resources in the world. The winds that first brought the British settlers to Australia, the Roaring Forties, blow as strong today as they did then. And now Australia is entering its 27th year of continuous economic growth and will soon surpass the Netherlands for the longest streak of any developed country. Historically, affordable and reliable energy have underpinned this economic growth, but so too has our private enterprise, our free markets and our robust institutions. Our people have pioneered several technologies that are now seen worldwide. For example, Australia is leading the way on solar R&D, and in the coming years, 60% of the world's solar PV will use technology developed in Australia. Australian households have the highest uptake of solar PV anywhere in the world, with more than 15% of households double the digit 
double the next highest of Belgium. We've also recently announced a feasibility study to expand the landmark Snowy Mountain Scheme, a four gigawatt hydroelectric system comprising nine power stations, 33 turbines and 16 dams, containing 12 times the volume of Sydney Harbour. This expansion would increase its capacity by half again and involve a technology called pumped hydro storage. Batteries often capture the limelight, but today pumped hydro actually provides 99% of the world's renewable energy storage. This is an iconic symbol of Australia's post-war nation building. Over 100,000 people, two thirds of them migrants from 30 different countries, worked for 25 years to complete this scheme. As is often the case, the United States was right there with us. In 1951, you agreed to train our engineers and provide technical assistance to the Snowy Hydro Authority. This was, of course, the very same year that ANZUS, which had been the bedrock of our alliance, came into existence. One can find in our treaties archive the Snowy Agreement, which was received by Percy Spender, our legendary ambassador in Washington under the government of Sir Robert Menzies. These examples show how Australia is taking an all of the above approach to addressing the challenges posed by the global energy transition. In Australia, these challenges are particularly acute. The national electricity market is the world's longest interconnected power system. It spans from Port Douglas in the north across the Bass Strait to Tasmania in the south. That's more than 3,000 miles, much further than the distance from Washington DC to San Francisco. Our national electricity market is not too dissimilar to the PJM interconnection, which links markets from here to Chicago and transmits around 800 terawatt hours, serving more than 60 million people. While the, mar while the NEM does not serve as a market, a market as large as PJM, Australia has only 24 million people, it is long and skinny and presents a number of challenges. In September last year, one of our states, South Australia, experienced for the first time ever a statewide blackout, putting 1.7 million people into the dark. This was a real wake-up call to the nation, the first time it had ever happened in our country and was very much the canary in the coal mine. It has also focused the discussion in Australia on energy security, and by which I mean the reliable supply of electricity as we transition to a lower emissions future. Americans have a healthy attitude towards failure and are good at learning from mistakes. It's important that we do the same in Australia. That's why we've commissioned Australia's chief scientist to produce a blueprint for the security of our energy market. And I note that Secretary Perry has recently announced that his department will undertake a similar review. I believe our blueprint will also provide worthwhile lessons to other nations, namely how to integrate more intermittent sources of power into the grid. One, le one lesson for us all is that you cannot rush headlong into renewables without adequately planning for backup power and the necessary frequency and control and ancillary services that are trip typically provided by baseload power and particularly fossil fuels. This means ensuring that there is more gas as well as not prematurely closing coal. We are already seeing some tr key trends play out in Australia and across the globe. Consumers are driving change as they take up solar, storage and electric vehicles. 
demand for energy from the grid is declining as generation is increasingly decentralised and we are also becoming increasingly more energy efficient. New technologies are emerging more rapidly and affordably than previously thought. And international commitments to reduce emissions are affecting energy mixes as countries seek to integrate their climate and their energy policies into one. And intermittent renewable generation is on the rise, but when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, power is not being generated, which makes planning much more difficult. Transitions have always involved tough decisions and periods of insecurity. During another energy transformation just over a century ago, Winston Churchill, then the First Lord of the Admiralty, converted the battleships of the Royal Navy from coal to oil, which would make his ships more nimble in combating the Germans. He told Parliament in 1913, on no one quality, on no one process, on no one country, on no one route, on no one field, must we be dependent. Safety and certainty lie in variety and variety alone. Albeit referring to oil, his words remain true today. Energy security re 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 requires a diversity of supply. And that's why Australia is pushing ahead with all types of energy sources and technologies without regard to ideology or the party tribalism which has often limited our options. At the same time as Australia's energy mix changes, so does our emissions profile. We now have the lowest emissions on a per capita basis and on a per unit of GDP in 27 years. Our target under the Paris Agreement is to reduce emissions by 26 to 28 per cent on our 2005 levels by 2030, which will see a halving of our emissions on a per capita basis. While Australia only contributes 1.3 per cent of global emissions, it is in our interests for collective global action to reduce the world's carbon footprint. For example, there are 178 countries emitting less than 2% each, and together they account for around 40% of global emissions. Australia has a strong track record of meeting its targets, and above all, we should be supremely practical rather than ideological. A transition is underway globally, and it does need to be managed responsibly. Today we can rely on renewables alone no more than we can rely on fossil fuels alone. Secretary Perry made this very point during his confirmation when he said he would advocate, and I quote, American energy in all its forms, and that includes renewables. America has been blessed with vast natural resources and the technology to utilise them. I'm committed to helping provide stable, reliable, affordable and secure sources of American energy. These words by Secretary Perry could very, as very well be made about my country, Australia. Indeed, the similarities between Texans and Australians extend beyond our people, our sense of humour and hospitality, which I have gladly experienced, indeed, to our energy systems. During Secretary Perry's tenure as Governor, renewables did increase significantly, and he also advanced clean energy technologies, such as carbon capture and storage. And tomorrow, I'll make my way to Texas, where I will visit the Petronova plant outside of Houston 
which began operation in January and which Secretary Perry himself launched earlier this month. One prime example of cooperation between the United States and Australia is Chevron's Gorgon LNG project in Western Australia, which at $54 billion is the largest ever single private investment in Australia. But interestingly, it will also be the world's largest carbon capture and storage project. And CCS has huge potential and is a major focus for our government. The head of the International Energy Agency, Dr Fadi Barol, has said, and I quote, CCS will not be optional in implementing the Paris Agreement, and that without it, the cost of the energy transition under Paris would be $3.5 trillion higher. And in a similar vein, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said the cost of meeting global emissions would be more than double without CCS. Another major focus for Australia is gas. And while we are projected to become the world's top LNG exporter, we are facing a tight domestic market. And this is due to a combination of factors, including state moratoriums and bans on the same gas exploration that has seen the shale gas revolution here in the United States. And LNG exports from the United States take place for the first time in decades. We could do worse than learning from the United States how to effectively and sustainably tap the large unconventional gas reserves that we have in our respective countries. Finally, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, these major energy market developments come at a time when particularly those in our region are hungry for energy and this shows no sign of abating. Energy demand is expected to grow by 30% over the next 25 years, according to the IEA. ExxonMobil predicts that 60% of this growth will be in the Indo-Pacific. All countries and their energy ministers are grappling, are grappling with this energy trilemma, balancing security, affordability, and lower emissions. But for many of our partners in Asia, they are also dealing with booming populations, high economic growth, and the demands of an emerging middle class. One cannot fault these countries for putting a premium on energy security in the basic definition of that term, that is the uninterrupted supply of energy at affordable prices. These countries can scarcely afford the ideological battles that plague developed countries over fossil fuels versus renewable energy sources. Indonesia is trying to meet an increase in energy demand of 8% each year. India's electricity demand is increasing at 5% each year and its power system will need to almost quadruple in size by 2040. It still has an estimated 240 million people without access to electricity, but the government has set an ambitious goal of 24-7 power for all people by 2019. Japan is ramping up its coal capacity after temporarily closing its nuclear power fleet, which had provided up to 30% in the wake of the Fukushima incident. In an effort to shore up energy supply, it is planning 45 high efficiency, low emission coal-fired power plants. And the most remarkable story is China's. Its energy production has tripled since 1990 and it overtook the United States as the world's largest energy user in 2009. China is increasing all types of power generation, coal, gas, nuclear, wind and solar. While coal will decrease as a proportion of China's overall mix, its latest five-year plan sets out a substantial increase in coal generation capacity. And this is reflective of the global transition that is underway. While coal will increase in absolute terms, it will reduce in proportionate terms from over 40% to just under 30% of electricity generation 
worldwide in 2040. What's most important is that Australia, the United States and our partners in Asia are able to manage this transition smoothly and judiciously. Past disruption in energy markets have given rise to new forms of cooperation. For example, the International Energy Agency, which emerged during the 70s oil crisis. Since that time, new players and priorities have emerged in global markets. And institutions are often built for the past crisis, but not the current or the future challenges. And therefore, the IEA is transforming itself as it modernises for this new energy world, recognising that energy is not just about oil, it's also about coal, gas, renewables and energy efficiency. And while China and India are not members, they have good working relationships with the IEA. ASEAN, which has a ministerial dialogue with the IEA, is also closely involved. Another example is the Clean Energy Ministerial, which has brought together countries including India, China, Indonesia and Korea, as well as the private sector. And Australia and the United States co-lead the Solution Centre, an initiative that assists developing countries and investors in Asia on projects related to energy security, access and resilience. And the collaboration on energy is of vital importance as demand but also potentially competition for energy increases. In conclusion, energy security is an absolute necessity for the development in the Indo-Pacific. Whether it's putting in place systems that will stabilise electricity grids and new technologies which will boost economic growth and reduce emissions. Or upholding the rules-based order in the region and maintaining open sea lanes which C CSIS has been so influential in advocating for. Or ensuring that countries can access the resources required to meet the needs of their people. Australia provides much more to the region than just our natural resources. We are at the forefront of new energy developments, including smart grids, carbon capture and storage, energy storage, energy efficiency, and remote off-grid electricity. We can help our Indo-Pacific partners meet the energy challenges ahead, many of which Australia is now addressing as the integration of renewables into the grid takes place. Energy security is an essential ingredient and goals for countries to develop peacefully, grow their economies and provide a higher standard of living. And the United States and Australia have a vested interest in the advancement of this endeavour and by working together we will make it a success. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Minister Frydenberg. I want to congratulate you on pointing out something that I think is uh, probably a hallmark of um, uh, energy security and the relationship between the United States and Australia. Uh, we, we have a lot of differences as a country, but we also have a number of uh, striking similarities, one being the diversity in energy supplies that you pointed out. Uh, and also this relationship between um, understanding that we need as stewards of these resources to make the most out of them, but also uh, how complicated that can be sometimes. All of the above sounds like a really nice uh, slogan, but it's actually quite hard to do mm -hmm. in practice, and I think both of our countries have sort of grappled with that. Uh, you, you brought up a number of things that I think are really interesting um, and would be of interest to this audience, both in terms of the relationship between the US and Australia, but also the transition that you're undergoing. It's, it's interesting because the U.S., again, as being an, another energy abundant country, the one place we've differed is we have a very large population, large economy, and large consumption of energy. And we're tipping over into a point where we're becoming an exporter, a net exporter of more and more of our resources as well. And there actually may be some things that we can learn from sure. Australia about how to pace that development uh, because abundance in and of itself, as you know, uh, doesn't equal security. You actually mm -hmm. have to work on timing these things uh, appropriately. And 
moreover, even though we're going through, as you remarked, on a, a, a once in a century transition in the nature of energy systems and what we're able to do with them, um, it often doesn't insulate us from commodity cycles, which is sure. the oldest problem in the world. Uh, sure. And so I, I thought maybe to talk a little bit about um, one of the issues you raised, which is the east coast of Australia and the natural gas situation as, as your um, uh, as your competition and consumer commission uh, pointed out, it had, had a triple whammy, right? The, the triple yeah. whammy being lots of LNG export being brought on at a time when the commodity cycle hit a low point and investment wasn't coming in. Um, and then uh, and then also not being able to have all of the the infrastructure and the and the resources you want to have developed because of moratoria and the like sure. this is not this is a situation the US could face it is a we have a, we have a difference in a lot of uh, uh, regions but but quite frankly for us exporting gas out of the country is going to require us to get it to places where it can be exported and so I wanted to know um, what is the status of the conversation about that? I know a few weeks ago it was really sort of thinking about monitoring the market for years out. There's been some press reports about maybe uh, thinking about more, more sort of serious measures or more concrete measures. Mm -hmm. What's the, what do you, where, where do you stand on sort of the, that issue? Well, the timing of the question is very, uh, uh, very good in the sense that the prime minister will be announcing later today. Yeah. Uh, we're all asleep now in Australia, so. Um, but when, he, but when he wakes up and uh, the country wakes up, uh, we'll be announcing a new mechanism to ensure sufficient gas supplies for our domestic market. Because as you say, there has been a triple whammy. When the FID, the final investment decisions were taken uh, for these major export uh, uh, contracts and, and projects on the East Coast back in 2010, 2011, uh, the oil price was around or above $100 mm -hmm. a barrel. And now it has slipped to, to nearly half that. Uh, and so obviously that changes the economics of the drilling programs that these companies can undertake, uh, which may make it cheaper, for example, for them to buy off the domestic market and suck up the gas that otherwise would go to domestic users, be it industry or households. Um, the other development that has occurred since the, the time of FID has been uh, moratoria and bans being placed on both conventional and unconventional gas extraction by some of the states in Australia. And unlike in the United States, uh, where here the, um, the landowner owns the resource under the ground, in Australia, it's the state governments that do effectively under the constitution, which means that there is not a gr as great a incentive for those landowners to develop the resource because right. they're not getting that revenue flow which they would otherwise get in the United States. So we've seen uh, a number of groups, uh, which are termed lock the gate groups, who have advocated for the uh, for the uh, um, for the ban or the moratoriums on this unconventional or conventional gas extraction, and unfortunately, that's got uh, political traction in some of these states. And that means, for example, in Victoria, they have um, enough unconventional and conventional gas to supply the whole of the East Coast for 40 years, mm -hmm. but that's locked up in the ground. In the Northern Territory, uh, they have enough uh, unconventional uh, gas to supply the country for over 100 years, mm -hmm. but that right now is locked up in the ground. And so what we are determined to do is to sh solve what is a short-term problem today, which is the tightness in the gas market, the predicted shortfalls that are coming, uh, but also solve for the medium and the longer term by uh, persuading as forcefully as we can these state governments to lift their moratoriums mm -hmm. and their bans on, uh, on conventional unconventional gas extraction. So we're taking a number of measures. Today's announcement by the Prime Minister is very significant, mm -hmm. um, but it also means that we're putting domestic jobs first and foremost, which is an obligation of government because you have thousands of uh, jobs, tens of thousands of jobs in Australia which are in industries where gas 
as an input is more than 10%. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I would never put you in the position to presuppose the Prime Minister's announcement, but <laughs> uh, when you talk about a mechanism, certainly uh, you, you also brought up temporary measures, not sort of a fundamental shift in position on exports or anything like that. Well, we've made it unequivocally clear um, that we will do what is necessary to protect jobs domestically. And right now, uh, given the state of the domestic gas market, we're seeing prices um, that are that are too high, mm. and that is putting a lot of pressure on uh, on jobs and balance sheets. Yeah, yeah. You uh, you also mentioned you've got a lot of reviews underway in Australia, which are uh, which are great. We're about to start a bunch of them here in the United States considered, as well. Considered policies. Considered so. policies. Yes, we're we're doing the same thing in our regulatory structure. Um, uh, so one of the one of the other ones underway is the Finkel review, as sure. you mentioned. Uh, huge transformation going on in the electric power sector. Again, another starking, stark stark similarity here with the U.S. We've got a lot of that going on as well. What's on the table in the context of that review? I mean, we, we, we have a wonderful patchwork of states and regions that are all trying their own thing. Yeah. Um, what, what do you, uh, not to, again, not to presuppose the sure. outcome of a process, but what's really on the table in terms of, uh, of you know, capacity markets or you know, other things that could come sure. into play in sort of navigating this transition in the electric power sector? Well, as I said in my speech, the uh, the blackout in South Australia was a seismic event in our country. I mean, you can imagine that uh, the traffic lights go out and there's gridlock on the streets. Yeah. People are stuck right. in elevators. Over a million people feel like they're imprisoned in their homes. Um, and the chaos that that creates is enormous. And, uh, and so it really was a wake-up call that we can't afford to see blackouts or load shedding uh, being repeated uh, to the extent that it damages the economy and disrupts, uh, disrupts the community as we saw in South Australia. So the COAG Energy Council, which stands for the Coalition of Australian Governments or the Council of Australian Governments, uh, brings together the state energy ministers and territory energy ministers and myself as the federal minister and I chair that. And we commissioned as a group the chief scientist to come up with um, with a blueprint for energy security and it's quite telling that we chose the chief scientist because what we were saying is that this is not an ideological issue mm -hmm. this is an engineering challenge about how do you integrate more intermittent sources of power into a grid which has historically been centralized relying on synchronous power generation um, and so what he is looking at specifically are particular measures um, that will smooth out this transition over time. Uh, one of the things, a lot of people focus on how you, uh, you need to price carbon, for example. There's been, we had a carbon tax, we obviously thought that was pretty bad policy and, uh, and got rid of it, fortunately. But um, there's great debates of how do you, how do you price emissions? We also need to have a debate about how do you price intermittency mm -hmm. because intermittency, be it solar and wind, um, is creating challenges about the level of predictability uh, for supply. So on one day in South Australia, wind can provide 100% of that state's power. But on another day, it could provide zero. Now that level of volatility is a huge challenge for market operators. And while we are very hopeful about uh, the future of battery storage, um, battery storage is not yet developed on the commercial grid scale that we need um, to stabilise that level of intermittency. And in South Australia, they have more than 40% of um, their power coming from predominantly wind, but also a bit of solar. So that's why the Prime Minister and his government had played a, placed a great emphasis on this pumped hydro mm -hmm. capacity because it's old technology. It's you know, reservoirs at the top of the hill and the bottom of the hill, and the water comes down, creating electricity when you, you need it. But when power is cheap in the middle of the night and available, you pump the water back up, 80% efficiency, yeah. and then you pump it down when you need it. So it's a big battery. And if we can get 2,000 megawatts out of the Snowy Hydro scheme or 
you know, similar numbers from doing something in Tasmania, which we recently announced, and also a feasibility study there, or other projects we've got running in South Australia and Queensland, we will get the storage capacity that we need to smooth out that transition. Yeah. And the other thing Finkel is looking at is um, how to get more of these frequency control and ancillary services, and those who work in the energy space will understand that, uh, and also inertia, yeah. and the other, the other qualities that you create a, you know, a, a steady 50, uh, 50 uh, um, uh, volt, uh, 50 hertz frequency, which you get from uh, synchronous generation, but you don't get from intermittent sources. So how do we create a natural market for those FCAS services mm -hmm. so that we can stabilize the system? Yeah, and, and that it's certainly an engineering challenge that states in the United States have been grappling with, and it's it hard to make the regulatory and market incentives yep. drive towards that engineering challenge, but it can be done. I want to turn to the audience and get some questions, but uh, one more question before I, I do. You did mention uh, uh, the Paris Climate Accord, but also the International uh, Energy Agency, which we're big fans of here. You, you're right, the US and Australia have played a real leadership role for years uh, in both the international innovation space, but also multilateral yeah. engagement on a whole host of issues. Uh, you know, the US is sort of trying to figure out the way that it plays in a lot of those things, both the Paris Climate Agreement, but also just how, you know, how it thinks about global uh, security issues uh, as they relate to energy. What I mean, do you have any messages or thoughts about that? I mean, I, you you were very complimentary to sort of the pragmatic uh, approach that you've heard coming from Secretary Perry so far. But is there one of the key questions here in the U.S. and especially in Washington right now is um, trying to have a discussion about what the what is the value of the role that the U.S. plays in those systems? In your experience, has it been really important to have the the U.S. involved in those discussions? And and what would you like to see coming from them going forward? Well, obviously, uh, decisions um, of this kind are, are matters for the United States. And you know, that's the first point um, that I would make, is that we're great friends and partners uh, and uh, collaborators with the United States in a whole host of areas. But those policy decisions they make uh, and they take in this area are really going to be matters for them. Uh, one of the things that I've been excited about uh, that the United States has been undertaking is focusing on energy efficiency mm -hmm. and various processes there. And uh, that's something that we believe could help meet a quarter of Australia's Paris commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, we've already got um, new standards in buildings, energy uh, efficiency for buildings, new standards in appliances, and we've got a process underway for vehicles. So for example, a state-of-the-art air conditioner sold in Australia in 2003 would not meet the minimum conditions of an air conditioner sold in Australia today. Mm -hmm. A building uh, in Australia that was built before 2007 would use 30% more energy than the same building built after 2010. Um, so there are huge efficiencies that are being gained by, um, by new standards, new technologies. Um, and the other thing that is we can collaborate on, and we do that through mission innovation, is, um, is uh, the, the R&D side. Yeah. As I said, 60% of solar PV technology in the next few years will have a um, hereditary line back to Australian uh, university R&D. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the United States, with all your uh, influence and weight in this area, I think can, can bring a lot to the table. Um, and I referred to it in my speech, the price of some of these technologies is coming down massively. Yeah. So solar PV has come down 80% in the last seven years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, battery storage is increasing in capacity by about 50% every five years, and that will accelerate, and decreasing in price by 50% every five years. Yeah. Uh, winds come down about 50% in price in the last seven years. So you're going to see a massive um, change in the, the economics of, of these new technologies. And I've just come from Israel today. Um, and for such a small country, they're doing incredible stuff in the, uh, in the solar part, 
in the solar space and in the battery space um, that uh, that you know I think will have that will have uh, greater application internationally. Now I'm glad you brought up the R&D side. It, it is really remarkable how much U.S. federal R&D dollars contribute to both the U.S. sort of ecosystem on innovation, yeah. but also globally. It makes yeah. a it makes a big pull. Okay, uh, I've already broken a rule because it's fun to talk to the minister of going a little bit over time, but we started late, <laughs> so we'll go a couple minutes over if your schedule sure, can allow anything, for it. Of course. Uh, we'll take some questions, please. Uh, name and affiliation question in the form of a question, and we'll group in in threes, and then you can kind of you sure. know take them all together. Sure. Okay, we'll start with John, and then we'll go to Bill. Mr. Greetings. Uh, welcome to Washington. Thank you. Um, Jonathan Elkind, now Columbia University Center for Global Energy Policy. So a follow-on on the, the question of how we work together um, uh, as Australia and the United States, and particularly in a time when there's obviously a different uh, policy wind, policy impulse here in D.C. Um, you made clear that Australia, as a resource-abundant country, is intent on that development while also responding to this global uh, historical transition in the energy sector. In the U.S., there are pretty loud voices that are questioning the underlying science of climate change. I wonder how does that, how do Australians react to that uh, impulse in the United States and how does that have implications for how we work together? Okay, and then we'll take a question from Bill right here. Minister Bill Eichward, uh, consultant and formerly in the energy industry. Uh, at the risk of raising a very complex topic, one of your known resource areas is the joint development area and the greater sunrise fields. I'm wondering if you could give us an update on where these complex discussions, negotiations, whatever you call them, um, are, are at and where they're headed. Uh, it may be on the half of the speech that you cut out. <laughs> and then we'll do the last one right here. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Minister, I'm Haigu Garaz of Argus Media. Uh, you spoke about Australia becoming first uh, number one LNG exporter, and of course the U.S. is catching up eventually. Uh, your government's office of uh, chief economists talked about how U.S. LNG supply might be uh, providing extra competition in the sense that it's, it's not oil-linked, unlike uh, Australia's. And I was wondering if that's an issue on your horizon and uh, what policy uh, would you be uh, recommending? Great. Okay. Great questions. Um, well, firstly, on the science of climate change, uh, we as a government have taken the position that we accept the science and now it's about uh, meeting our targets. Um, and, uh, and we take our targets very seriously and uh, they're ambitious targets. Um, uh, that has been our government position and, and what we are trying to do uh, is um, do it at the lowest cost uh, and to take the ideology out of it. Uh, and so therefore we have a range of mechanisms. We have a mandated renewable energy target. Currently we have about 17% of our power generation coming from renewables. The goal is to take that to 23.5% by 2020. Uh, we have what is called an emissions reduction fund with a few billion dollars, a couple billion dollars in it, which has been a mechanism for uh, running an auction process, uh, mainly land, uh, land users and others, um, to bid in a, uh, uh, projects to reduce emissions. And then we will create a bid stack and then take the lowest cost. And we've managed to reduce emissions by 189 million tonnes at an average cost of $11.83 a, a tonne of abatement. So that's been a pretty cost-effective mechanism. Uh, we uh, also um, have our energy efficiency program, which is the standards I was referring to. The goal is a 40% energy productivity boost by 2030. And then we have um, two organisations. One's called the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which we put $10 billion into it, which is a loan program. So you have to get a commercial return. It's the bond rate plus a couple of percent on investments uh, where they will provide a proportion of the, the finance to renewable energy projects uh, or energy efficiency projects um, that are uh, being rolled out on a commercial scale. And so far the return has been, uh, has been good. And then we have another organisation which a couple of billion dollars are in called the uh, Court Arena, which is the Australian Renewable 
Energy Agency, and that puts money into R&D, uh, and it's a grant program, so it's just money out the door, but it leverages off the private sector, so over a billion dollars has been given out, but that's leveraged you know, a couple of billion extra dollars, and that's gone in to a whole range of projects from battery storage technology to wastewater treatment that uses energy efficiency to a whole lot of other things. So um, there's a whole range of things that we're doing, um, designed all that to add up to, uh, to, to meeting, our, um, our meeting our targets. But we're continuing to review, continuously reviewing our, our uh, stack of policies to ensure that we've, we've got it right. And, and as you would know, like in the United States, these are pretty contested political spaces. And unfortunately, ideology sometimes uh, yeah. overwhel you know, uh, plays itself into the debate more than it should because we really should be focused on practical, um, cost-effective approaches. Um, there was a question on the Greater Sunrise and East Timor. Uh, this comes under the Resources Minister's portfolio and the Foreign Minister has been involved, obviously, uh, quite, quite a lot because it obviously had a legal, uh, a legal angle too with the International Court of Justice, but what the two parties have agreed, East Timor and Australia, is to, to negotiate this and that continues to be done. Um, our view has always been uh, that East Timor will get you know, the lion's share of, um, uh, of, uh, of those projects but that we need to work collaboratively to do it. And uh, it's in Australia's interest that East Timor is economically successful. Absolutely in Australia's interest. And, and so we want to work collaboratively with East Timor for them and Australia to, to benefit out of those resources. So those negotiations, and they're obviously sensitive negotiations, but we continue to have them in good faith. Mm -hmm. um, on the issue of US competition into the uh, into the LNG gas markets. I mean, the great advantage Australia has is proximity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're in we're in Asia, uh, the doorstep of of those high uh, high demand countries, uh, including China and Japan. Japan's our traditional market, and Korea, but increasingly they've gone elsewhere. Um, India is a growing market for us, and our Prime Minister was recently in India just a couple of weeks ago, and um, that's very prospective for us uh, with gas as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the key challenge, because right now gas prices have come down quite significantly in the global spot, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. spot market because there is more supply, but the great advantage that Australia has is proximity to markets and its reputation as a reliable uh, supplier, and that will continue. There's all lots of speculation about oil linked versus gas linked contracts, but yes. you know, oil link versus oil linkages can look good depending on what part of the cycle you're in, and you can't get Henry Hub unless you're in Texas. So mm. it all has its. Uh, <laughs> and one of the really interesting debates is how gas becomes a substitute for coal. Yeah. And obviously, you're pl that's playing out here domestically sure. as well, because you know you've got three to four dollar a petajoule gas. Uh, which in Australia we've got a multiple of that. I mean, back in 2013, you're, you were paying about five dollars a petajoule here, four to four, closer to five. We were paying three to four. Now we're paying eight to ten, and uh, you're paying three to four. So it's a complete reversal of fortunes that we're seeing in Australia and the United States on the gas front. But gas plays in um, lower gas plays into how coal is used quite significantly as well. Yeah, in both markets and in Asia as well. well you've been very generous with your time. I want to thank you very much on behalf of the Southeast Asia Program, the Energy and National Security Program for being here. There's, there's a, a lot that the US and Australia can continue to learn from each other, so we hope you'll come by more often. Thank you. And can I also, I saw in the back as I came in, Michael Thorley, uh, for many you probably will know him, but he was a very distinguished Australian ambassador. Oh, I didn't know. He, he, to, uh, to, uh, to Washington. Um, I've got the chip off the old block, his son working in my office now. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm hope hopefully that bit of magic will rub off. That's but, a very uh, appropriate <laughs> shout out. Well, thank you very much. Thank Please you. join me in thanking the Minister. Thank for you. Being